And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk meaning embrace. And I suppose if I were going to add anything to that, it would be you want to be careful who you're embracing. And secondly, you want to be careful who's embracing you. Because you're going to find out in this chapter 1 that the enemy makes a little net to catch the fish, which they call Christians, and try to embrace you into captivity. So um, you want to make sure that it is your father that you embrace in your heart, your mind, your soul, and that you follow him. Habakkuk, there's probably not all that much known about him except he was probably a prophet during the time of Jeremiah. I'll just simply say that and, and, and uh, let it work itself out. And um, also, he is a prophet to Judah, and it has to do with the Chaldean captivity, or you might say Babylon. Now, any time that the king of Babylon is involved, as we left the king of Assyria in the last book, usually you want to be real cautious because it is a type of the king of Babylon in the great book of Revelation, which is the king of confusion in the end times. As a matter of fact, you will find that the Antichrist is referred to by type more than once, even in chapter 1 and 2. We'll talk about it as we go. So, the great book of Habakkuk, and remember the fishnet. Chapter 1, verse 1, and it reads, The burden which Habakkuk, the prophet, did see. This is uh, the oracle, the... Um, caring of our Father to enlighten His children of truth. That's to be the burden. Verse 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and uh, thou wilt not save. And in a sense, apply that to this earth age even now when we see the violence we have in this world, it, the senselessness of people blowing themselves up and killing each other uh, and even turning that into a religion that they gain by doing wrong. That's sad. It's more than sad. It's sick. Sick, sick, sick. And they pass that off as religion. And I'm not knocking any religion or anything. It's only the four outers, I'll say, that um, believe in uh, fairy tales. Verse 3. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? Uh, no, that's oppression and injustice, okay? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that rise up strife and contention. Um, it, uh, you want to always remember, it's going to always be with us, beloved. Until Christ returns, you're going to have violence, you're going to have strife, you're going to have confusion. And unfortunately, our press is such that reports it the bad, never the good, hardly ever. So you have to kind of read between the lines and absorb the good for yourself, okay? Because they're, to them, news is blood in the street. To them, news is, um, is the wicked. Not, not the good. So make sure that you, don't, you are not robbed of the promises God has made us. Verse 4. Therefore the law is slacked. It's, this word in the Hebrew can even be translated paralyzed. The law is paralyzed and judgment doth never go forth. You never see it. For the wicked... And this is Rasha in the Hebrew tongue, wicked one. And, and it, it looks forward to the king of Babylon, even on to the king of Babylon of the end times, which is to say the false Messiah. Doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. And that's just the way it is. You might as well get set for it. But you don't have to put up with it, okay? 
uh, people will try to take advantage of you and certainly if you're not looking and if you cannot see you with companion Bibles read your uh, companion column and it will indicate to you that this wicked one Risha is the false Christ as well uh, the king of Babylon you want to be aware of that and um, see that um, that prophecy is understood by you and you're, you're never caught short you're never disappointed verse 5 behold ye among the heathen and regard and wonder marvelously for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe though it be told you you're not going to believe it now Many of you know we've, we've had reference to this in more than one prophecy that uh, in the end times God will work a work. You know something? You're prepared for it. You're a part of it. And that um, marvelous work of God's elect in dealing with the wicked one is fantastic. And uh, a lot won't believe it. A lot will never believe it. And that's fine. That's okay. Why? Because not everybody's got his, God's elect to, see, to be able to understand God's Word. Most, most even go to different churches that will say, you don't have to understand God's Word. You're going to be gone. Well, that's not what God's Word says. And you're in a heap of hurt. Okay? Verse 6. Listen carefully. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans. This is the Babylonians that bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause it to happen. And the king of Babylon did exactly that. Verse 7, they are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Uh, their, the, their way of doing things. You know, the Babylonians had, like when they hit Jerusalem, they took everything of any value, especially the sacred vessels. And you'll all remember what happened following Nebuchadnezzar when one of his uh, grandsons decided to have a party with the sacred vessels, all right? Verse 8. Their horses also are swifter than the leopards and are more furious than the evening wolves. They're keener. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall cover from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. Uh, uh, when they come, it's going to be what it's telling you in the future is sense. It'll be worldwide. And that, of course, sets up one world, the one world system in that uh, what is Babylon again? The Chaldees, it's confusion. And never has there been a time that confusion covered, uh, covered the world as it does now in the minds of people. You know, of all times in the world that you should have a seal in your forehead, which is to say your brain, your mind, is to possess the seal of God, which is simply to say his truth conveyed from this letter he has written you into your mind as to what's going to transpire, whereby he can use you and whereby you will be useful that's what this letter is about. Verse 9. They shall come all for violence, not for our Father, not for righteousness, not for judgment, but for violence. Their faces shall sup up the, the east wind. They're eager to do it. And they shall gather the captivity as the sand. They're going to take it like as if it were the sand and that in that number. Going to take everybody. And again, that's when, when you put that to the future, it's all-inclusive. 
whomsoever will, the opposite of whomsoever will believe on the only begotten Son, but whomsoever will allow themselves to be deceived by this system of confusion. Always remember Father's word. God is not the author of confusion, but peace. Verse 10. And they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. In other words, if they come to a wall or something that is difficult, they'll simply push dirt up to the height of the wall and go over it and conquer it, all conquering. You see, the sad part is this is done by deception and confusion. Babylon is Babel, and Babel is confusion. If you confuse the people, the majority, whereby they accept the fact that your leader is a heavenly being, come to bring salvation, and it happens to be none other than the king of Babylon, you've got problems, friend. You've been deceived. And if you're not familiar with your father's letter, you're about to be embraced by the wrong Savior because the false Savior, meaning false Messiah instead of Christ, instead of bringing peace, he brings death. Verse 11, then shall his mind change and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God, um, the false one. It's coming. You can count on it. 12, art thou not from everlasting, O Lord God? He continues his prayer. Aren't you going to do something about this? Mine holy one, we shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment. You promised it. And, O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. You used them to scatter the children. They've overdone it carried it too far. 13, thou art of purer eyes um, than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity, sin, corruption. Wherefore, lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? The, again, the wicked is the wicked one, Rasha, the Antichrist. How can you stand by and let this happen? Well, I've got some good news for you. God doesn't stand by and let it happen to those that are righteous enough to read his letter, to read it with understanding, whereby they know, and, and having he having given us power over our enemies in this, in, in this uh, generation, anyone that puts themselves at the mercy of such as this, it's their own fault. Usually done through ignorance. Ignorance of what? Ignorance of God's word. Because all you have to do to have Father's help is to do exactly as Habakkuk did here, is cry out to him, reading his letter with understanding and knowing how to use the power that he has instilled within us through the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome all of our enemies, not part of them, all of them. Verse 14. And make us men, this word in the Hebrew is Adam, it's important that you note in this book, as, and make us men as the fishes of the sea, poor little Christian fishies. Do you know how a school of fish does? If the little head fish turns this away, the whole school turns this away, and you've got one big glob of little swimmers, little fishes following the leader, ho, ho, ho. As the creeping things, they have no ruler over them. Um, it would appear that they follow a leader, all right, and he's not a good one. 
They do not have a leader that is from God over them that says, hey, you're about to swim into an embrace of the mighty one, the wicked one. What do you want to do that for? Well, now, a person that has any intelligence knows you don't want to swim in the enemy's net. Stay out of it. You see, your father makes all things known, and man should only fear what he doesn't know. And what God is showing you here is how important it is that you absorb his word, whereby you don't flay yourself or trot yourself into the trap by playing little fishy, Christian, into the net. Be wise. I'll add a little footnote. Be wiser than the serpent or you'll end up as fish bait. Verse 15. They that, they take up all of them with the angle. That's the trap. They catch them in their net and gather them in their drag. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Um, with the false Messiah, they're happy to crawl in his net. Save us now. Save us now. They don't know that the false Christ comes first. They haven't been taught that. Why? They weren't taught God's word. You don't have to understand God's word. You don't need to understand the book of Revelation. You're going to be gone. Be careful, my friend. The net is in place. Don't swim into it. See who you embrace. 16. Therefore, they sacrifice unto their net. That's kind of sad, isn't it? And burn incense unto their drag. Their lies and deception wherein they use to entrap people. I could even say dumb people. Dumb because they're a lack of God's word. Because by them, their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. Uh, the God of force takes them in. Whether they like it or not. A friend, uh, you know, you need to learn enough, at least from Father's Word, to stay out of this net. Because you see, if you're familiar with Father's Word, you know who it is that's casting that net. You know where they came from. You know what their plan is. And there is no way that you're going to be entrapped or embraced by that, tr that um, confusion because you have the truth and the truth sets you free from the lies and deception that are peddled in this generation. Verse 17. Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? Of course they won't. They're going to continue it to take over the world. And uh, that is their plan and uh, they seem to be doing a pretty good job, only I got some good news. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen as uh, many might think it would. Chapter 2, verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me up on the tower. Do you know what that is? That's the watchtower. I'm going to be a watchman for my people to see this doesn't happen and will watch to see what he will say unto me, what, what God is going to answer me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. A watchman looking for help, okay? Two, and the Lord answered me, now listen carefully, and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables. You make a big sign that he may run that readeth it. You bring it out in full view and you send a messenger with it so that all can read the truth. Three, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. When? To last generation. Basically, that's what it's leading up to. But at the end, it shall speak and not lie. God's word never lies. Though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. God's word always comes. Do not let snuffers at truth throw you. 
a curve. God's Word always comes to pass exactly as it's written. You can count on it. You can depend on it. Quite frankly, it's one of the only sure things in this world is God's Word. I cannot imagine how anyone would want to be without that truth, that warning. Verse 4, Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. It's not right. But the just shall live by his faith, a just one. They believe not, they live not. You believe and you live. You got it? I said, they believe not and they live not. You believe and you live. We're talking eternal. Five. Yea, also, because he transgressed by wine, he is a proud man. Uh, I, I told you when the last man translated Adam, this word man translates Gebar. Neither keepeth at home who enlargeth his desire. The word desire should be translated soul. Nefesh. His, uh, his desire as hell and is as death. Why? His name is death. He is death and cannot be satisfied. There is no satisfying him. You couldn't go far enough with him but gathereth unto him all nations, one worldism. Heapeth unto him all people, all but God's elect. Not going to happen, friend. At the end, this is God's answer to this, the king of Babylon. You want to be very careful, my friend, because you happen to live in that generation. And though this was written many years ago, it applies to you as well today, for it is prophecy from your heavenly Father assuring you, warning you of the net, of the traps, that you do not slip or slide or fall into it. Verse 6, shall, shall not all these take up a parable against him and a taunting proverb against him and say, woe to him that increaseth that which is not his, belongs to our Father, how long, question, and to him that ladeth himself with thick clay. In other words, tries to be a flesh man in clay, but he's not. He's a giver. He's supernatural. But he wants to be like Christ who walked the earth, son of man, meaning he was clay. He can't quite make that ripple, okay? Take up that parable. Take up that slogan, that proverb. Remember it. I'm going to show you who it is that takes up the proverb here in a minute. The, and uh, and it, it is a parable to most, but it shouldn't be to you. Verse 7. Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee? Don't let them, my friend. You don't have to. And awake that shall vex thee, and thou shalt be for bushes unto them. Um, no way. Why? You don't have to. Why? You have power over them. What is this proverb? We're going to go there. Go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 14. I mentioned the false Messiah. Who is he? Who is this one? Would God not tell us? Would God not identify who he's talking about here? So that you're warned completely and indeed. Chapter 14, the great book of Isaiah, pick it up with verse 4. Verse 4. 
that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. That's who it is. Now, who is this king of Babylon? Well, hang on here. And say, how hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? Five. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. And he's going to. He's going. And you know something? He has given you the power and the authority as far as your life is concerned to do it today. As far as your family is concerned. Verse 6. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, never eased off, always there. He that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. Nobody's going to help him. God will get tired of it sooner. This is the proverb. His day is coming. He's going to get it. Who? The king of Babylon. Well, who's that? Well, find out here. God never leaves us lacking, okay? Seven. The whole earth, and that's the whole world, you got it, one worldism, is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing or into thanksgiving when every knee will bow on the first day of the millennium. Verse 8, yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against us. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right from the garden. And Father, thank you for the tree of life. That is to say, Messiah. But God uh, relates people. And of course, cedar being the tree that never the leaves never die or fall off, supposedly. It's always there because God is the life giver that gives us that life. Verse 9, hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. In other words, your grave is waiting. It stirreth up the dead for thee. Even all the chief ones of the earth it hath raised up from their throne all the kings of the nations. Who is this? Who is this ruler of all the nations that puffed up and finally God is smiting? He's going to tell you. Verse 10, All they speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? I mean, you, yeah, let, me, let me follow this a little bit further so that you understand. He's claimed to be God. As it's written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he's going to stand in the holy place claiming to be God. He thinks he is. And the people after his fall, or the beginnings of his, of his fall, say, you're, you're weak like we are. You're not God. It's going to be a sad time for a lot of people to learn this when you should already know it. That would be almost too late, my friend. Verse 11. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee. They're like a sheet of them. And the worms cover thee like a blanket over the top. He's Mr. Death, and Mr. Death he is. Now, who in the world is this king of Babylon we're talking about, that this proverb... Now, there's not a change of subject here going to verse 12. We're identifying who he is, okay? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? I mean, you know, what are you doing down here on earth? Son of the morning, morning star... Always copying the names for Christ. You got it? That's what the word Lucifer in the Hebrew tongue means. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne, not God's, my throne above the stars of God. That's the children of God. 
I'm going to be their ruler. I'm going to lead them. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, Mount Zion. That's why you can understand 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where he sits on, on Mount Zion claiming to be God. That's New Testament, friend. That's when Paul was telling you don't get caught up in the rapture doctrine. It's not going to happen until after this one sits in the holy place claiming to be God and you have work to do rather than be deceived and caught in the little fish net. Nice little Christian fishies. The congregation in the sides of the north, God's throne was always on the north. That's what Satan wants. Will he get it? Well, a lot of people are going to make room for him. Why? Because they truly are going to think it is God through the Son come to rapture them out of here. That's what his message will be. How many will listen when a supernatural entity, the Son of the Morning, bright star descends to this earth and deceives the sons of men. Are oh, you become weak like us? We thought you were God. They deserve to be deceived, but it's still very sad. Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. I'll be like God. Satan has always wanted that. And you know something? He feels he's that good, do you? He's a deceiver. I hope he doesn't have you deceived that he's going to come and load you up and fly you out of here. That's why God would say in Ezekiel 13, verse 18, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls. Verse 15, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. That's where you're going and those others with you. 16. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man, Ish? Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that deceived kingdoms? that control the world, claiming to be God? Don't, don't learn that the hard way, my friend. Because you would be one day late and uh, more than a dollar short. That's an old figure of speech. What that means is too late to come to the wedding. Sorry, Charlie. Better luck next time. Don't be deceived. Babylon is confusion. And there is enough confusion in the world today to go around for everyone that will not find the foundation in the Word of God and allow the rock, Christ, to be your foundation. Don't, don't be deceived or caught up in ignorance in the, this time of trouble, Jacob's trouble of bringing back all of the scattering by the Assyrian and by the king of Babylon, historically speaking, into the folding embrace, Habakkuk, to embrace of Almighty God, warning you about the trap. See that you don't fall into it. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment. Won't you please?